live from New York City, it's The Gary Mel Show. And now, your host, Gary Mel. Hi, everyone. I'm Gary Null, broadcasting, but not today, video streaming because I'm on location. We have an interesting show in that we have one of those Conversations with Remarkable Minds interviews. We're going to have Professor Henry Giraud, who holds the Global Television Network's Chair of English and Cultural Studies at McMaster's University in Ontario, Canada. And he is quite simply, in my opinion, one of the most articulate activists, progressive scholars, thought leaders and prolific writers critiquing American politics and culture. We're going to talk about our national challenge to face the rise of American fascism. I think you'll find the discussion interesting, and I'm setting aside more time than normal for it. Also today, we're going to take a look at the solidarity with medical students who demand single pair now, an open letter, and that is from Common Dreams. I'm going to mention a few things, short things, not in-depth, about how the 139 House Democrats joined the GOP to approve $717 billion in military spending. So they're always going to say, how do you pay for infrastructure? How do you pay for universal health care? How do you pay for improving schools that have fallen down? Well, stop giving $717 billion for bloated, corrupt, completely worthless, unnecessary military industrial complex. Oh, I forgot. You're receiving money from those people, so of course you're going to say it's needed, but the other things are not. Now also, there's something from Alliance for Natural Health I thought was of importance to you, and that is that the government is aiming, under the influence of Bill Melinda Gates Foundation, to dictate your vitamin dosage. Not just which vitamins you should be allowed to take, but what dosages. Now, I looked at the Codex Elementarius that they're basing their thoughts on, and these are amounts that are so low, they would offer no therapeutic value at all. So, once again, a group of individuals like Bill Melinda Gates and the people in that field with them are wanting us to no longer have control over our bodies and freedom of choice. I'll deal with that. So we have a lot to share with you. Let's begin. First up, we have a highly anxious teen society. Now, teens at different times have always been anxious. You're going through changes. You've gone through puberty. You're now starting to see things happen to your body. Your place in society is being defined by your friends. And just as a side note, I don't know if your parents ever discussed this with you, but at some point in life, you will be defined by the qualities and characteristics and character of your five best friends. So therefore, to all parents-to-be and current parents, choose carefully your friends, because epigenetically we share energies. Epa, larger, genetic, our genes are influenced by the people that we hang with, that we socialize with, our relationships. So if there is anything that's destructive, negative, fatalistic, uh, anything coming from a person's dark side, but we choose to keep that person in our life, we become that. We have to defend it. Well, they're really a nice person. And making them the enemy. You're not looking at the means. You're looking only at the end result. I see. Wow. So this is just one of the points that stress a lot of people. Every single day, each one of us are coming up with these, these conflations. I'm for the environment. Are you? That's good. Then why are you drinking from a plastic bottle? Well, I'm still for the environment, but you're eating meat. You're eating a hamburger. Well, that's, that's not relevant. I'm still for the environment. You, you're saying something, but you're not showing me. Why can't you simply say, look 
at what I've excluded in order to protect the environment. But we're not doing that. Instead, we're living contradictory lives. So if our friends are living contradictory lives and we are not willing to to challenge that, then we absorb the rationale and make it our own, just like this, just like this conversation I had with this guy. And then once you accept that something is negative and you absorb it, when you accept abuse and you absorb it, when you accept rationalizations and you absorb it, then you become it. You enable it. Just a simple thought that I can frequently tell a lot about a person by the friends they keep. And uh, anyhow, a lot of people today have friends that, that do not honor higher ideals. Now, when I look at a kid that is spoiled, entitled, irrational, has no sense of reason, no patience, I can't blame that, that young person. It's their parents, more often than not, that put them into a position of being just enabling parents. <clears throat> But it still ends up with stressing everyone. Everyone in that gets stressed because stress creates waves of energy like a ripple effect and it impacts everyone. So what do we do? According to Columbia University, mind-body therapies can help teens with anxiety. Well, since almost every teen has anxiety for a million different reasons, some legitimate, most not, then then listen carefully to these because these are simple. And this was published in the journal Nurse, uh, Nurse Practitioner. Body-mind therapies, quote, affects anxiety, one-third of all U.S. adolescents, with more than 8% experiencing severe impairment in daily functioning, quote, whereas anxiety and fear are typical reactions to the academic, social, and developmental challenges common during the adolescent years. Clinical or pathological anxiety is excessive, persistent, and disruptive. Biofeedback helps. Now, biofeedback was very popular in the 1970s, and it enables individuals to increase self-awareness and physical control through feedback on biological measures. And uh, there are many studies showing biofeedback significantly reduces anxiety and stress. And then you have mindfulness. And mindfulness incorporates aspects of meditation and breathing to help us focus attention on the present moment that we're in and separate from negative thoughts. And there are dozens of studies showing that mindfulness helps teens with anxiety. Then yoga is one of the most popular mind-body therapies with positive physical and mental effects, including reducing anxiety. And finally, it's hypnosis. And I believe it's grossly underused. Now, I happen to know and have been friends with Lloyd Glauberman and Donald Mullen and Elaine Kahn and <clears throat> Alan Putterman and Michael Elner. All were outstanding therapists. They were humanistic therapists, but they all used hypnosis. Now, hypnosis doesn't mean you don't have control. You're, when you're being hypnotized, you're sitting there thinking, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not feeling any different. But you are, because it's taking you to a, a, a different level, because it incorporates imagery and relaxation techniques to help you control stress responses. And it works. So for those in this world who are suffering from high levels of anxiety, then that will help you. Now, from Henry Mendor University in France, psoriasis patients can eat their way to fewer symptoms. That's good news. They looked at 3,500 French psoriasis patients and that found that a healthier diet, the less severe their symptoms. And specifically, the closer an individual adhered to the nutritious Mediterranean diet or high plant-based diet, now, we know that the Mediterranean diet is heavy in fruits and vegetables and whole grain. It does have fish, olive oil and olives, and nuts and seeds, and very little in the way of meat and dairy. And it's considered heart healthy, okay, and helps prevent cancer, yes, but now this new study shows that it can help psoriasis. 
And then they did another study of 36,000 respondents and found that those who adhered to a plant-based diet had the highest percentage of improvement from psoriasis. From the University of Laval in France, published in the Journal of Agricultural and Food Chemistry, gum disease, which is rampant, is a common condition among adults that occur when bacteria form biofilms or plaques on teeth, and consequently the gums become inflamed. Some severe cases uh, end up with periodontal conditions, and then the doctor uses antibiotics. But now scientists have discovered that wild blueberry extract could help prevent dental plaque formation. It is published in the ACS's Journal of Agriculture and Food Chemistry. And so a lot of people have gum disease that is not obvious. They may have gingivitis, but and you'll have red and swollen, sometimes easily bleeding gums. And if left unchecked, the condition can progress to an advanced periodontal condition because the plaque hardens into tartar and the infection can spread below the gum line and destroy the tissue that supports your teeth, including your jaw. So blueberry extract every day. You can eat blueberries. That would be good. You can take blueberry concentrate. That's better. But get the blueberries. Now, from the University of Toronto comes a new study discussing the portfolio diet. If you haven't heard of the portfolio diet, it's a plant-based way of eating previously shown to lower cholesterol levels and reduce the risk of factors of cardiovascular disease, including blood pressure, triglycerides, and inflammation. In addition to reducing the LDL, or the bad cholesterol, by about 30% when combined with, with a low saturated fat diet, uh, it also is equal to what a medicine would do. That's what they found. And, uh, quote, we've known the portfolio diet lowers LDL cholesterol, but we didn't have a clear picture of what else it could do. And this study allows far greater clarity and certainty about the effects of the diet and its health potential. And the researchers conducted a meta-analysis that com combined results from seven controlled trials involving 400 patients and found that specific risk factors varied, um, like you could lower your blood pressure and you could lower inflammation and you could protect your heart. Quite simply, a plant-based diet can save your life. This was published in the journal Progress in Cardiovascular Diseases. Also from Fukushima Medical University, your zinc levels are associated with prognosis for heart failure. So according to the news, zinc, as we know, is an essential cofactor for energy transfer and physiological heart function, and it has antioxidant properties, and it's very important in multiple signaling pathways. But also we found that in this study that it can, if you're low in zinc, you're more likely to have heart failure. And it doesn't require a lot of zinc, generally 15 to 20 milligrams a day. So just make sure you're getting your zinc. And from the National Eye Institute, about 2 million people in the United States have advanced macular degeneration, the leading cause of blindness, and with another 8 million at risk. So you're talking about 10 million people, no small amount. And they're saying here, and this does not include the 20 million Americans with cataracts or clouding of the lens of the eye that commonly affects uh, people as they age, but they're saying that a vitamin and mineral formula can a re help with the reduce the risk of macular degeneration. Now, of course, you know that because you've been hearing me talk about this for a long time. This was published in our journal Ophthalmology. But they're simply saying that 15 milligrams of beta carotene, 250 milligrams of vitamin C, 400 units of vitamin E, e uh, two, 2 milligrams of copper, 80 milligrams of zinc, Reduce the progression of macular degeneration by 25%. That's terrific. Now, I would add in a lot of other nutrients that I know reduce inflammation and oxidative stress in the eye, and I sure as the Dickens wouldn't give such a low amount of vitamin C. I would start someone at 5,000 milligrams and 15 milligrams the B-complex, 
copper, two milligrams is fine. 80 milligrams of zinc is actually too high. I would reduce that. Xanathine, I would give. Lutein, I would give. Lycopene, I would give. And uh, then you would really see very important effects upon the eye. And finally, from the uh, Quindao University Medical College in China, they took a look at a lot of studies and found out that lying around and watching TV leads to greater risk of depression. Now, there are dozens of studies covering hundreds of thousands of participants, and sedentary behavior was linked to a 25% higher likelihood of being depressed compared to people who were not sedentary. So, it's that simple. And you've got to get up, you've got to exercise, and I suggest never sitting for more than two hours and get up and then do your exercises and, uh, and also try to get one of those desks that you can raise up or down so that you can, you can just go up on your toes and back on your heels, up on your toes, back on your heels with bent legs, and that will help increase circulation. I'm Gary Knoll. We're 23 minutes into our program. That's the latest on health and healing. We're going to take a break and come right back. Please stay with us. Let's now go up to Hamilton, Ontario. We're standing by as Professor Henry Giroux. I've already given you his background earlier in the program. Nice to have you with us today, Henry. Oh, hi, Gary. Good to be with you. Henry, it's always a pleasure to have you back on our program. I want to start off with job and economic growth figures that the Trump administration touts and parroted by the mainstream media in the New York Times and CNN mostly because this fits into understanding in the new form of fascism emerging in this country. They will say, look at all the jobs. We have the lowest unemployment rate in African Americans and Latinos and women. Uh, and this is not true. Uh, this is like the good Germans who supported Hitler because he brought jobs. The good Arme Americans are also filing behind Trump because of these so-called economic gross statistics, and yet when they say unemployment is in the 3 percent, by any reasonable metrics, it's around 22 to 26 percent. When you add in the 102 million Americans who once worked full-time are not able to find full-time work or even part-time work or stop looking and no longer are subscribing to unemployment insurance, or no longer qualify, you leave all those people out, sure, you're going to have a low unemployment. But lying about statistics, lying about how good everything is, while we're overlooking how many people are on food stamps, how many American children are go to bed hungry or food insecure, uh, how bad our infrastructures are, how that we've not done anything about global warming and putting people at risk where they live, and yet none of that is looked upon. They simply look at, well, our unemployment rate, and isn't the economy really good? And before this interview, I did some checking and mining and logging is up 14 percent, which relates to opening up our public lands and deregulating the mining and fossil fuel and lumber industries. And this is obviously catastrophic for the environment and a reason why the U.S. greenhouse gas emission rates are skyrocketing again, but also service high uh, jobs, which include jobs that give infrastructural support to the regime and construction jobs show the second highest growth, which would go along with hires for building and converting new detention centers, prisons, and most construction now is going towards government contracts for military installations and surveillance centers and other federal constructions. Then I noticed the smallest growth has been in utilities, meaning that our critical infrastructure, such as our electrical grid and water utilities, are being ignored, and work in transportation and warehousing are also on the rise, which are the lowest paying jobs, than all other sectors such as professional careers, business, education, and even 
Retail are flat to no growth. So when you look at this, it appears to me that the government is creating the good Americans, people who will ignore and remain ignorant of the collapse of our democratic uh, society solely because Trump is bringing them jobs, and whatever else he does makes little difference to them. His character, his morals, his lack of judgment, his lack of expertise, that is irrelevant to them. And to me, personally, this is the roots of national socialism uh, and one of the defining characteristics of fascism, not to be confused with democratic socialism, which I support, such as the younger generation today, which is demanding. Your thoughts? Well, I, I, I think that what, what we're getting at here is that you have, you have a guy who trades in myths and mythologies and lies and in, in order to basically support uh, a base that seems to be in many ways too ignorant to, to even check with the facts, even though the kinds of arguments that he's making are going to bear down on them, you know, that I, I think uh, will, will in part ruin their lives. I mean, look, the real index, you want to measure the index, the index not to talk about economics in an abstract sense uh, as, as a measure of what the good life is. The real index is to talk about how we treat children. The real index is to talk about how many people are in poverty. The real index is to talk about what our health care system is like and who has access to it. The real issue is to talk about matters of vulnerability and suffering and misery. And, 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 and as a matter of fact, as we know, Trump has actually eliminated those words for the Center for Disease Control so that they don't even become part of the equation. So I, I think this is, part, this is part of the politics of diversion. I mean, this, this, this is a politics that lies. This is a politics that acts as a camouflage for consolidating wealth in the hands of relatively few people. And it's a politics that ultimately is at odds with any vestige of democracy. I appreciate that. Thank you for that insight. You quote Hannah Arendt's question, are the events of our time leading us to become a totalitarian society? And this is where Americans suffer from historical amnesia. If a person is historically illiterate, they are unable to come up with any clear um, discernment of where they are at during this particular historical moment and are clueless of where it might lead. And since I hold that the Trump phenomena was born earlier with Clinton and Bush and Obama, and it's not simply a case of a completely new, unexpected, violent virus that has appeared. What are some of the events or trends we are witnessing right now that you believe are most leading us to become a totalitarian fascist state? Well, I, I think there are a number of things. As I point out in my new book, uh, American Nightmare, Facing the Challenge of Fascism, uh, I mean, there are a range of, of, of issues. I think, first of all, fascism starts with words. What we have with Trump is a language of brutality that legitimates hatred, racism, and violence. We have a language of racial purity and white supremacy that is unapologetic in terms of how it views uh, religious and ethnic and racial minorities. We have a language that targets certain groups through the rhetoric of war and fear and anti-intellectualism. But I think that if I had to go down and, and talk about fascism in its new form, which I call neoliberal fascism. I mean, I think there are a couple of things you have to realize. I think that at one level, you have an economic system of extreme capitalism that has produced massive misery, a massive degree of resentment and anger. And on the other side, that I mean, what that then mobilizes is a whole range of issues that we can associate with the past that raise alarming warning signals, whether we're talking about his ultranationalism. We're talking about the claim that America was in decline. You know, a, 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 a very, very generic fascist trope. Whether we're talking about how he elevates instinct over emotion, and his anti-intellectualism, his contempt for the rule of law, his contempt for weakness, his, the hyper-masculinity, the fear of the other. I mean, so what we now see in the United States, and, and actually in a number of other countries uh, in Europe, is we have the rise of this neo-fascism, this neoliberal fascism, in which the economic system creates conditions so bad that all of a sudden people fall for the strongman myth. They, they fall for the swindle of fulfillment. They fall for easy answers. And Trump basically is nothing more, in my estimation, than the endpoint of a long, uh, an endless 
series of assaults on democracy that now have come to fruition. He's the Frankenstein monster that has been in, that has been cultivated since the 1970s. I, I would like you to speak, please, about the death of the Democratic Party, which is something you and Chris Hedges and William Robinson and many others are addressing. From your perspective, how is the Democratic Party now, at this moment, contributing to the specter of fascism before us? And, for example, Common Dreams just printed a – that's only what's above the line. There's another $700 billion below the line. That does yeah, not well, even include our military, uh, of the the national security agencies, and so, and when asked about social spending, like for better schools, to ghettoizing neighborhoods, uh, creating jobs, uh, they say, "Well, how are we going to pay for it?" But they don't blink an eye when it comes to spending money on the military or wars around the world, which they have all done. I think you're absolutely right. I, I mean, I think that one of the things that we have to recognize is that if neoliberalism is, the, is, is the, this form of casino capitalism, which is entirely indebted to the financial elite, if this is the engine that now creates the conditions for fascism in the United States, then we have to ask ourselves a very fundamental question, and that is, what is the role of the Democratic Party in either supporting or resisting it? Well, the answer is clear. It doesn't resist it at all. Uh, and as a matter of fact, not only is it indebted to the financial elite, but it constantly refuses to, to do two things. One, critique the excessive spending in the military-industrial uh, security complex that could easily support a whole range of public goods from national health care to free, free higher education. It refuses to do that. I mean, go back to Hillary Clinton's campaign when she was asked, how do you feel about uh, 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 free higher education? She says, oh, we can't afford that. We can't afford that, but we have the largest military budget in the world. We can't afford that, but we refuse to not tax. We refuse to tax the rich. We refuse to put a, a, a tax on trades. Uh, come on. I mean, I mean, it's very clear that when you balance the Democratic Party's support for a society in which there is no poverty to hold people back and prevent them from li living a decent life and have access to the most uh, important social services from education to health care, they're, they're just simply a weak version of the Republican Party. And so I, it seems to me that, uh, and, and by the way, let's even go further. Not only does Pelosi claim uh, you know, oh no, we, we, you know, we don't support socialism, I mean, she's just outrightly argues that position. But this is a party that increasingly is doing everything it can to prevent its more progressive elements from actually being elected to office. So I don't think there's any question. The Democratic Party is the, is the party of refuge. You know, it's the party of, of corruption. It's the party of, of plunderers. It's a party in bed with the financial elite. It's a party that turned its back on the working class. You know, it's a party that basically never fully addressed matters of racial and economic justice. And so to say that they are now the party that we should side with and you know, to somehow resist Trump or to paint them as being on the forefront of the resistance against Trump. I mean, when you get somebody like Michael Hayden who says, well, we're, we're, we're really moving into a fascist state, or Madeleine Albright, who had no trouble with the death of 500,000 children as a result of sanctions against Iraq, while she was uh, Secretary of uh, Secretary of State, uh, this is uh, this is just simply outrageous in my mind. Yeah. I supported all the whistleblowers, uh, including Snowden, and yet the Democrats under Obama and Clinton uh, wanted them arrested and impeached, and and so both the Republican and Democratic administrations seem to be playing from the same uh, set of rules and yet try to act as if we're for the blacks, we're minorities, we're for the migrants. And I believe that they're playing this whole uh, immigration so that with the hope that they can try to convince these millions of immigrants, legal and illegal entrants, that we're for you. And they've never been for them. They lie. And when they say to the African Americans, when Clinton especially said, we're for you, and then she said, we're for the unions, and they passed NAFTA, and GATT, and she increased the uh, – her and her husband increased the, uh, the time you'll spend in prison for simply possession of drugs and didn't pardon those people 
And then she was against gay marriage, and then she needed their votes, so she was for it. And I'm thinking, do they understand that a lot of the people who voted for Trump knew what Trump was, found him despicable at every level, no moral compass, no integrity, no literacy, but they were so angry at the people who were smooth-talking, charismatic, and made promises but never delivered, and as a result, it was a protest vote. That's I mean, the Democratic I, I, Party today. I mean, I think it was, I, I think it was certainly a protest vote, though I, though I think it was also more than that. But I, but I think that the thing you want to remember is that fascism emerges out of failed democracies and I, and I, or, or military dictatorships military overthrows, generally failed democracies. And I, and I think that what you had in the United, what we have and have had in the United States, particularly since the 1970s and the collapse of the welfare state and the collapse of any notion of shared citizenship or shared responsibility and the emergence of an enormously cruel culture, which now seems to think that any form of dependency is a weakness, if not an aberration, should be treated with disdain. I mean, I think that what we have is, is a democracy that no longer seems to have any substance, a politics that's been emptied out of any meaning. And I think that you couple that with an educational system that prides itself on its ignorance and its civic illiteracy rather than on its intelligence and its ability to create critically engaged citizens, you've got the perfect storm. You've got a storm in which ignorance now is searching for alternatives in ways and for which there isn't a language available to really provide them with alternatives that speak to their condition and for the possibility of truly living in a just and democratic society. Hence, what you get is you get the bombast. Hence, you get the strong man. Hence, you get the liar. You know, hence, you get the spectacles. Hence, you get the, the group resentment. Hence, you get, the, you get the racism. You know, you get the attack on immigrants. I mean, all of this is cathartic. You know, it's not informing. It's cathartic. It's a terrific way to release a kind of collective resentment that has no place to go except to succumb to anti-democratic and fascist impulses. Black Lives Matter is drawing attention to police violence and its intrinsic racism. Yet police violence is really a manifestation in part of the violence of the state and the government. It's been militarized. So can you draw a connection between the violence of the government and how it's also being expressed through law enforcement? Oh, I think that's a terrific question. I mean, I think that you have a government that basically operates off a law and order agenda that is really quite clear uh, in terms of not only its own racism, I mean, calling black neighborhoods cultures of crime uh, or separating young children from their mother's arms at the border, which replicates what often happened at the concentration camps in Nazi Germany. Well, I mean, you have a, you have a government that is now saying that lawlessness is the order of the day, that this is a country that increasingly organizes civil society around the, the organizing principle of violence. I mean, when you have a president who appears before a number of chiefs of police, I believe it was in New Jersey, and says, hey, you know, when you put these thugs in the car, you know, bang their heads in. Uh, and, and then the police chiefs, the head of the police chief association, actually sent a note out apologizing uh, for the comment. Or when you have a president who, who basically makes the claim that he can shoot somebody in the middle of Times Square and his people would still follow him, or suggests endlessly that uh, Democrats who, or did suggest that Democrats who didn't stand up at the end of his State of the Union address were, could be uh, basically held up for treason, or his attack on, the, on journalism and the critical press as the enemy of the American people. I mean, you, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to see where this goes. I mean, this enables a culture of violence, and we see it in the statistics. It, we see it in the increase in synagogues being attacked, the increase in Muslims being attacked, the people being, painting swatch stickers on school walls. I mean, you look at the figures from the ACLU, it's alarming. And I mean, this guy uh, trades in a culture of demonization, a rhetoric of violence, and basically has turned the United States into an armed camp. Fortunately, we're witnessing a backlash against fascism and racism and inequality in global elites among younger adults, not just in the U.S., but in many countries around the world. Now, you speak of one of the ways a, a protest against a fascist state is to create democracies in exile. Would you please, Henry, explain that to give us some practical considerations of how people can participate more proactively in this pro-democratic venture? 
I, I think that what people are doing are, are recognizing that ideas basically gain their force through institutions. And I, and I think that what that means is that many people are building alternative institutions in order to get, provide a semblance of how democracy might actually work in reality. Whether you have the sanctuary movement, uh, in, in which, you know, as you well know, ch you know, churches and uh, of, of various faiths are now saying, hey, look, we think people matter, we think human rights matter, and we're going to create spaces where people can come together and protect each other and support each other. You have it in people who are, are basically mobilizing alternative forms of health care, you know, who are, tr who are trading goods for health care. You have it in young people who basically are saying, look, we need, we need to provide new social spaces through the Internet uh, and produce new, a new rhetoric of politics that basically will allow people to be able to think uh, otherwise in order to act otherwise. In the red states, you have a mass movement of women who are doing everything that they can to make sure that Trump's candidates don't get elected again. And I think that's fine. I mean, I, th I think in the short run, we should do everything we can to make sure that Trump policies get discontinued. In the long run, we've got to basically create a system that restructures the system so that we recognize that capitalism and democracy are simply not the same thing. I have one final question, Henry, and that concerns the authoritarian takeover of our media. Soon we'll have a Sinclair Broadcasting Company launched, which is basically a media arm for Trump's policies and worldview. And we already have Breitbart determined to replace democracy with a perverted racist nationalism. What does this portend to you? I, I think this is probably one of the most important issues that we can raise on this program. Because it seems to me that if you really want to understand how authoritarianism works, You've got to look at the formative cultures that make it possible. And I think that one of the central elements of any totalitarian, any fascist regime, is to take over the media. I mean, the right has always recognized that education is central to politics, that you have to change consciousness to change agency, that you have to re get people to rethink, uh, remobilize, redirect, reenact their sense of desire, action, their sense of the future, their sense of their relationship to the, themselves and, other, and others. And I think that when you so limit the, the media sphere to, to basically a handful of corporations who can now dictate literally almost every aspect from their commanding institutions of policy, practice, daily life, and what it means to be a citizen, that is enormously dangerous, so dangerous that it seems to me that one of the great struggles of resistance that we now have to push for is creating alternative media sites. I mean, they, you know, we, you have to have sites where people can have access to alternative points of view, have access to, to speakers who basically are being banned from the, from the right-wing ecosphere. And I, and I think that increasingly more and more, especially young people, are doing that. Many liberal Voices, Common Dreams, Consortium News, Truth Dig are also being banned. Google and Facebook are not allowing their algorithms to carry their stories to the audience. So they'll publish something, but very few people read it. In fact, uh, Richard Gale was checking with them and found out that their readership and support is down almost 40%. Uh, with at least 150 of these sites, many that you've been published on, because they're banning them as well. So progressives are being banned as well. Absolutely. I, I mean, look, I mean, I, I, you know, thinking is dangerous, and, and it's not just dangerous for fascists. I mean, it, it's also dangerous for the right wing. It's also dangerous for, in many ways for some, many conservatives. It, it's dangerous for people who have a stake in the system that want people to believe that there's no alternative to the system. And I think that, you know, when you all of a sudden uh, provide options and answers and facts and insights and historical uh, uh, mode of historical consciousness and memory that challenges dominant relations of power, you're in trouble. I mean, you know, think about a guy like like uh, Ben Carson, you know, who says says something like, uh, you know, poor people really, really, you know, are too stupid to, to really be able to uh, uh, to get support from the government, you know, or that after you know, slaves were immigrants. And all of a sudden, there's an enormous backlash because people drew upon history. They embarrassed them. You know, they, they made it difficult for that kind of nonsense to be reproduced. And I think the corporate media knows this. And I, and I think that they're doing everything they can to eliminate what they would call 
what, you know, the very possibility of thinking. Remember, Hannah Haran said something crucial about fascism. She said, she said fascism at, at its root is, the, is, is to create a situation in which it becomes very difficult for people to think, to stop thinking. And, uh, and I think she was absolutely right. I appreciate these insights. Thank you very much, Henry, for being with us today. We look forward to our next conversation. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And that's Professor Henry Giroux, and his new book is American Nightmare, Facing the Challenges of Fascism. And one final thought <clears throat> before we sign off here today. One of our listeners asked us about a, uh, a New York Times uh, statement that what are we going to do or anything when the New York Times is suggesting that Margaret Sanger of Planned Parenthood be given a statue. They're looking for famous women. I certainly support that. And so I want to thank Phil Marino for emailing me about my thoughts. Let me quickly share this. First of all, Margaret Sanger died in 1966. She was born in 19, uh, 1879. And Wikipedia has a squeaky clean, nothing controversial statement about her there. And uh, she popularized the term birth control, and, and to her credit, she opened the first birth control clinic, only staffed by women physicians in the United States, that later evolved into Planned Parenthood in 1921. And to her credit, uh, she wanted to prevent back alley abortions, and she was the inspiration for the comic book figure Wonder Woman. And she started a diaphragm, which no one would make us, you know, no one would make in the United States, and the government refused to allow it. And they, they were confiscating, but she had it made in Japan. She was a member of the Women's Wing of the Socialist Party and fought for labor rights, hanging out with John Reed and Upton St. Clair and Emma Goldman. And when she was prosecuted in 1914 for her book Family Limitation, which promoted her philosophy, she fled the United Kingdom. And she also worked with a few African-American leaders, such as James Hubert and W. E. Du Bois, and because she saw the need for birth control education in the black communities with higher teenage pregnancies. Now, that's all good, but read Linda Gordon's excellent book, Women's Body, Women's Rights, A Social History of Birth Control in America. Sanger is quoted as saying, quote, we do not want word to get out that we want to exterminate the Negro population if it ever occurs to any of their more rebellious members. In her book, 1922's Pivot of Civilization, Sanger wrote about blacks and immigrants, quote, human weeds, reckless breeders, spawning human beings who never should have been born, end quote, direct quotes. Also in the same book, quote, we are paying for and submitting to an ever-increasing, unceasingly spawning class of human beings who never should have been born at all, that our wealth is being diverted from the progress of human civilization, our eyes should be open to the terrific cost to the community of this dead weight of human waste, end quote. In her 1938 autobiography, quote, I accepted an invitation to talk to the women's branch of the Ku Klux Klan. I saw through the door dim figures parading with banners and illuminated crosses. I was escorted to the platform, was introduced, and began to speak. In the end, through simple illustrations explaining the problems of inferior races, I believe I have accomplished my purpose. A dozen invitations to speak to similar groups was proffered, end quote. Let us understand this. Eugenics found agreement with other eugenicists, especially Havelock Ellis from the British Eugenics Society of her time because both sought to help the human race eliminate those who they considered unfit. Her only disagreement with the dominant eugenic movement of the time was being that a woman's first duty was to the state, by the way, which Hitler resonated with and not to herself. She divided humanity into different groups, those who were educated, informed, and responsible, and those who were quote, irresponsible and reckless, often due to religious scruples which she attacked. This is the group she discouraged uh, procreation. She wrote in 1921 that the purpose of promoting birth control, quote, was to create a race of thoroughbreds, end quote. And two years earlier stated, quote, more children from the fit ed, uh, ed class um, and less from the unfit. That is the chief aim of birth control, end quote. 
in her uh, essay entitled, We Must Breed a Race of Thoroughbreds, she argued for her Planned Parenthood clinics should be established, quote, to breed out of the race the scourges of transmissible disease, mental defect, poverty, lawlessness, and crime, since these classes would be decreasing in number instead of breeding like weeds, end quote. But selective breeding was also advocated by Winston Churchill and Herbert Hoover and Theodore Roosevelt and George Bernard Shaw and H.G. Wells. She believed that for the purpose of racial purification, couples should be rewarded if they chose to be sterilized. She advocated in 1932 that couples be required to submit an application to the government agencies to have a child, and the government would discern, determine whether or not you were intellectually capable of having a child. And on Mentally Handicapped, in her 1932, quote, Plans for Peace, Sanger outlined her strategy for eradication of those she deemed, quote, feeble-minded, meaning if you were a person who had handicaps, you should have been killed or never allowed to live. Her steps included immigration restrictions, compulsory sterilization, segregation to a lifetime of farm work, and black pastors, uh, albeit Republicans, are trying to have her bust statue removed from the National Portrait Gallery at Smithsonian Institution, Washington, D.C. Do I believe that she deserves a statue? Not at all. I believe that those women, and there are thousands who were leaders who did not have a dark side and do not have to be apologized for. When you hate people and you do believe that they should not be born or they should be euthanized, and she suggested euthanizing 10% of the American population if you were poor, if you were a single mother, and uh, many blacks, uh, yeah, don't honor someone like that. And shame on the New York Times for not looking more thoroughly at her history and having the courage to say, this woman did a few things good, which I told you, but an awful lot that was rotten to the core. Let's now go with George Carlin on dying. I think you'll appreciate it. See, you know what I've been doing? Going through my address book and crossing out the dead people. <laughs> you do that? That's a lot of fun, isn't it? Gives you a good feeling. Kind of gives you a feeling of power. A superiority to have outlasted another old friend. But you can't do it too soon, you know. You can't do it too soon. You can't come running home from the funeral and get the book out, you know, and be looking through the book. You can't do that. A little time has to pass. You have to let a little time go by. I have a rule of thumb, six weeks. If you're a friend of mine and you're in my book and you die, I leave you alone for an extra six weeks. Six extra weeks in the book on the house, it's on me. Now, speaking of dead people, there are things we say when someone dies. Most of us say, a lot of us do. Things we say that no one ever questions. They just kind of go unexamined. Give you a couple examples. Uh, after someone dies, the following conversation is bound to take place probably more than once. Two guys meet on the street. Hey, did you hear? Phil Davis died. Phil Davis? I just saw him yesterday. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Didn't help. <laughs> he died anyway. <laughs> Apparently, the simple act of your seeing him did not slow his cancer down. In fact, it may have made it more aggressive. <laughs> you know, you could be responsible for Phil's death. How do you live with yourself? <laughs> Here's another thing they say after a death. This is usually said to the surviving spouse. Listen, if there's anything I can do, anything at all, please don't hesitate to ask. What are you going to do, a resurrection? The same of New Testament, you know. You know what you tell a guy like that who wants to help? Oh, fine, why don't you come over this weekend? You can paint the garage. <laughs> Bring your plunger. The upstairs toilet overflowed, and it'll over the floor up there. <laughs> Do you drive a tractor? Good, that'll come in handy. The North 40 needs a lot of attention. <laughs> Bring your chainsaw and your pickaxe. We're going to push to work. <laughs> he wants to help? Call his bluff. <laughs> Call his bluff. Don't hesitate to ask. The nerve of these... Here's another thing we say to the surviving spouse. I'm keeping him in my thoughts. Where? <laughs> Where exactly in your thoughts does he fit? In between my shirts and this chair and the waitress? What are your priorities? We use a lot of euphemisms when we talk about death, you know? People say things like, you know, I lost my father. Ah, he'll turn up. 
You got to stay optimistic with people like that. Give them reason to hope. Have you checked the dumpster out back? He used to like to take a nap in there. Keep it upbeat. Now, there's something else that uh, is said after uh, a death, but this one involves belief, which is where I begin to have big problems. <laughs> this one happens after the funeral, after the burial, back at the house. Back at the house where the family and friends and the loved ones of the deceased are having some food and drink and they're enjoying some warm reminiscences of the person who passed away. Sooner or later, someone is bound to say the following, uh, especially after a few drinks. <laughs> you know, I think he's up there now, smiling down at us. <laughs> and I think he's pleased. Now, first of all, there is no up there for people to be smiling down from. It's poetic, it's quaint, and I guess for superstitious people it provides a little comfort, but it doesn't exist. But if it did, if it did, and if someone did somehow survive death in a non-physical form, I personally think he'd be far too busy with other celestial activities than to be standing around paradise, smiling down on live people. What kind of eternity is that? <laughs> and why is it no one ever says, I think he's down there now, <laughs> smiling up at us? <laughs> Apparently, it never occurs to people that their loved ones might be in hell. Thank you for listening. I'm Gary Knoll. Have a nice day.